Welcome to our Commodore classroom uh, regarding the presidential election, which is quickly approaching. And tonight's programming is hosted by the New York chapter for our alumni. My name is Margaret Phillips, and I graduated from Vanderbilt in 2015 as a double major in public policy and political science thanks to Professor Lewis and all of his amazing classes and allowing me to pass those. And I now live in New York and serve on our New York chapter alumni board as our uh, Commodore classroom chairman. So I'm here with our alumni relations staff members, Catherine Hooper and Caroline Johnston. And I just thank them for all of their work and their effort in making tonight possible. Also joining us tonight are New York chapter co-presidents, Nick Levenger and Jackson Bott. To start, I'd like to give you a quick update about our New York chapter programming before I introduce our speaker and guest of honor, Professor David Lewis. The main uh, announcement for our New York chapter is that our networking night is Thursday, November 12th. This year, it will be an industry-based networking night and we hope you all will join us. So please take a look for our email or information on social media if you'd like to register and join us on that evening. Second, Professor Lewis will be hosting a follow-up to tonight's Commodore classroom on November 17th. Obviously this will be after we have the election results or maybe if we have the election results, but nonetheless, we'll be eager to hear his views on what has happened uh, between now and the weeks ahead. So please, we encourage you to invite your chapter friends from across the Eastern Seaboard, family, and any colleagues that might be interested in joining us. At the end of uh, Professor Lewis's discussion tonight, he will take questions. And so please feel free to use the chat box and we would like to take questions from the audience um, towards the end of the event. So as we continue through our discussion, if anything comes to mind that would be of interest to ask Professor Lewis, please feel free to do so. And finally, our alumni relations staff will post a quick three question survey in the chat box as well. So it would be a big help if you wouldn't mind completing that before you leave. And now I would like to introduce our speaker the Rebecca Webb Wilson University Distinguished Professor in the Department of Political Science, Professor David Lewis. Professor Lewis's research and teaching interests include the presidency, executive branch politics, and public administration. He is the author of two books and numerous articles on American politics, public administration, and management. He, his work has been featured in the Harvard Business Review, New York Times, and Washington Post, just to name a few. He is a member of the National Academy of Public Administration and has earned numerous research and teaching awards. So although we aren't in audience mode, please join me in welcoming Professor Lewis. So Professor Lewis, I think we will get right to it. Um, it is obviously an exciting time with developments happening every day including, I'm sure this audience has reflections from last night's uh, debate. But I thought given that we're less than two weeks away from uh, this, this uh, pending election, millions of Americans have already cast their votes and we're all watching the polls closely. So in your view, as we think about polls, how reliable are they? What do you think is the path to a Biden victory versus a Trump victory if we're talking about uh, what we're seeing today? And how might things change between now and the few days we have before election day? Okay, well, thank you, Margaret. So first, let me just say it's a pleasure to, um, to be with you all. I, I saw on the guest list a number of familiar names and I'm sorry that I can't see the faces along with the names. So hello to all of my former friends um, from here in Nashville. And I wanna particularly thank uh, Margaret and Catherine and the team for putting this together. Um, it doesn't seem like that long ago when Margaret was a student and, uh, um, but time has gone by <laughs> pretty, pretty fast. So it's a delight to see Margaret and she really gets a lot of the credit for pulling this together. So thanks Margaret for doing that. Um, 
Yeah, so let's talk about the, uh, the election and I'll try to do the best I can to um, shed a little bit of light here. So the first question that Margaret asked was, um, what about these polls? And I think there's reason to be a little bit cautious about the polls given the experience that we had in 2016. Um, so, you know, clearly going into the election in 2016, most of the projections that combined all of the state by state polls had Secretary Clinton winning, or at least they would say somewhere they, she had between a 80 and 95% chance of winning. Um, so what to think this time? Well, um, I, I want to say, as I would have said in 2016, that I think the polls are pretty reliable with a few caveats. So let me say a little bit about that. Um, so why reliable? I guess the first thing I'd say is the national polls in 2016 were pretty accurate, actually. So the, the polls going into the election night had Secretary Clinton up by about three points, and she won by about 2.1 or 2.2. So it was well within the, the margin of error. Where we got difficulty was in the state by state polls. And so I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. The other thing here to remember is that these polling organizations have strong incentives to make error corrections. So if they got something wrong in a previous election, um, they have incentives to try to get it right. That this is, a, this is a, an industry where there's a lot of money to be had if you have a reputation for doing accurate polling and getting things right. And so I think there's the incentives work in the right direction to, to make the polls accurate. Um, that said, I, I will say that um, in some of the recent comparisons between the 2016 polls and the 2018 polls, um, things are better, but there are still some errors in the same states that there were in 2016. So there's there's some reason to be cautious there. Okay, so what are some of the caveats? So I, I, I generally think the polls are pretty good um, with, with a couple of caveats. One is we have to remember the margin of error, right? That these are Polls are basically, you know, finding 500 people or 1,000 people in Pennsylvania and asking them their views about the campaign and assuming that the 500 or 1,000 people that you get are representative of the entire state. And um, sometimes that's true and sometimes not. And that's why we have these um, margins of error around the, uh, the, the polling. And in 2016, the polls in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania were well within the margin of error. And it turned out that it, the, the president did well. He did well because in the last two weeks of the campaign, a lot of the undecided voters moved in his direction in ways that weren't picked up. And also the polls were within the margin of error. So we need to be mindful of that. The other issue I would say here in terms of polling, and, and then I'll sort of move on, is these polls are of likely voters. So, you know, we think about doing polls. We're not polling the entire population of the state. We're not polling only registered voters in a state, we're trying to figure out who's like actually gonna vote on election day. And so there's a little bit of an art and science in terms of figuring out likely voters. And so if turnout turns out to be a lot higher or a lot lower than we expect, that can affect the outcome in, in systematic ways. And it looks like this year is gonna be a high turnout year. Um, and so hopefully the polling organizations have adjusted to that reality in terms of the ways they're um, uh, doing their numbers. So that's the, that's the polling side. Margaret, do you want me to say anything more about that or just sort of jump into some of the, the projections? Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I think if you can comment on the projections, that would be perfect. Great. So we're all relying, we, we all hope these polls are, are, are accurate. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that they're more or less accurate moving forward. Um, okay, so what are we thinking about here? Well, obviously a lot of the numbers that get bandied about if you're just trying to, um, uh, modulate or curate your political news tend to be national polling numbers, and um, and those tend to have the uh, Vice President Biden up, you know, seven, eight points, and those have been pretty consistent. He was a little higher a couple of weeks ago, um, but most campaign officials will tell you that they never really set out to win the popular vote, right? They set out to win 270 electoral college votes, and um, so let's talk about the map. Um, the way that these campaigns tend to break up these maps is into in, by categorizing states, states that are gonna be definitely for us no matter what we do, states that are gonna be definitely for the other candidate no matter what they do, and then some of these states in the middle that kind of lean our way or lean the other way or that are genuine toss-ups. Um, the electoral map in its current form based on the polling um, 
pre presents a, a, a more difficult map for the president than it does for Vice President Biden. So let's just start with some of the basics. So if we, if we just look at the states and the Electoral College map where the gap between the two candidates is over 15 percentage points, like a big gap between them, um, this would give, we just sort of separate those states out and count the Electoral College votes. Um, this would give Vice President Biden 183 Electoral College votes and President Trump 72. Um, and this is, you know, without doing much of anything. And, and, and there's a reason for this. So Democrats tend to do well on the West Coast. Um, it's pretty reliably Democratic. And they do well in the Northeast, which is also pretty reliably Democratic. And then they tend to do well in Illinois, at least recently. So states like California, Washington, Oregon, Hawaii, um, they're going to vote Democratic more or less regardless of what the vice president does. Um, then you pick up Illinois, which has 20 electoral college votes, and then you get New York, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut. So you sort of do those numbers, and it comes out to 183 electoral college votes. And our target we're trying to get to if you're a candidate is 270. The president has a little bit more difficult task this way in terms of states where that gap is that is that big. So Republicans tend to do well in the interior West and then the South. So we kind of talk about it as the L. So the president will almost certainly win Idaho, Wyoming, North Dakota, Oklahoma, um, Nebraska, and then Arkansas, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, West Virginia. So that's 72 electoral college votes. So already there's a map there that has um, an easier path for the vice president than it does for the president. If we now say, okay, well, 15 point gap is pretty big. What if we just look at a map where it's where there's a 10 point gap or bigger, then what does it look like? The vice president here would pick up Colorado, New Mexico, and Virginia and bring his electoral college vote total up to 211 electoral college votes. So just, you know, still got to get to 270, but making good progress there. The president would add Utah and South Dakota, um, and that gets to 79. Okay. All right. Um, what about five point gap or bigger? That's, you know, probably outside the margin of error where if we just sort of count it that way. In this case, the vice president adds Nevada, Minnesota, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and New Hampshire, at least as of yesterday. So the polls do fluctuate a little bit. That would put the vice president at 269, so one short of 270. And the president would add Montana, Kansas, Missouri, Indiana, and South Carolina, and have 125. So overall, the map is pretty strongly tilted in favor of the vice president at the moment. That doesn't mean the polls won't change or that voters' attitudes won't change in the last couple of weeks. Um, but it means that the president um, has to do really well, close to running the table in a lot of these uh, toss-up states. And so we may know pretty early on election eve uh, what the election is going to look like for the president if he doesn't, if he loses one of these key toss-up states. Like if he loses Florida, there's a hard path for him. If he loses Pennsylvania or he loses Wisconsin, it's going to be it's going to be difficult for uh, for the president. So that's kind of the maps. Um, and so we can talk a little bit about strategies like, OK, given these toss up states, how do we get there? But that's that's sort of what the what the world looks like at the moment. Thank you. That's really helpful. And I might actually just um, go off of one thing you said, which is we may know the results on election night, especially if we have counts in from Florida and other uh, other prominent and important states. How viable is it though that we don't have these results? And what happens if there is not a clear winner due to you know the amount of um, uh, uh, mail, mail ballots that are being uh, counted and other delays that might be possible? Um, I think it would benefit all of us to understand a little more about the rules and deadlines in place that you know, will ultimately determine whether President Trump or Vice President Biden is, uh, is victorious. Yeah, so it's a, it's a good question, Margaret. Thank you for asking it. Um, I think there's a reasonably I think there's a reasonable chance that we won't know the outcome of the election on election night, unless it 
really is dramatically in favor of one candidate or the other. Um, and the reason for that is that there's such a high number of, or such a large number of voters who are voting um, either absentee or, um, you know, where the mail-in ballots that won't be counted. Um, and so there is a good chance that on election night, the, um, it'll be close enough in terms of people voting on election day that that gap that could emerge or that, that the votes that are from mail-in or other kinds of, of voting um, could swing the election one way or the other. And if that's the case, a state won't certify an election winner um, because they'll wait until they can count those out. And then there are lots of ways that the campaigns can challenge those um, different kinds of voting, the, the mail-in voting in particular. In, in many states, the administrative burden associated with doing a mail-in ballot or voting early is quite complicated. And so you can imagine um, contests around, I signed the, the place, I signed the, the ballot in the wrong place, or I signed where the date is instead of there, or I forgot to sign it at all, or I used the wrong envelope or something like that. And so you can imagine that there could be challenges. Now, um, the reporting on this suggests that um, that the um, the it's more that there is a, a partisan skew in the way people are voting. So um, Democrats are more likely to vote mail in in most states, and they're um, so more likely to vote early. And so, um, if on election night the president is ahead in a state, but there's still a ton of uh, ballots to be counted. There is a strong incentive then for the president's campaign to challenge all of those ballots in ways that could drag out for quite some time. Um, so, and we saw this in the close case in 2000 when Vice President Gore and um, then Governor Bush were were competing. It just took a long time. Remember hanging chads and you know these kinds of things. And there are lots of ways to contest these ballots. And the president could say. Um, you know, there's been evidence of voter fraud and maybe supported by Republican governors or state legislators um, sort of argue that there's bu a bunch of these ballots are invalid or ballots have been lost or there needs to be an investigation. And so uh, multiple reasons to delay the certification of the vote. If that happens, um, then the question becomes, all right, what, what do states do in that case? The hard deadline for states is December 8th. So um, uh, the, the existing law says that each state must appoint by December 8th a slate of electors to vote in the electoral college to guarantee that Congress will accept the credentials of those electors when they send their votes to be counted by Congress in January. Um, so states will have a strong incentive to try to come to a decision by December 8th. Now, if that looks like it's unlikely that the legal challenges or other challenges associated with the counting of the votes is uncertain by December 8th, it may be the case that state legislators in particular states say, we're going to pull back the authority to choose who the electors are ourselves. We're going to take it away from the voters and we're going to decide for ourselves and implement the will of the voters directly ourselves and choose a slate of electors ourselves to be certified to send to Congress. Um, where things get wonky is um, if there's disagreement about that move, either between the governor and the state legislature or between, um, you can imagine a situation where, um, you know, a, a Republican state legislature or a Democratic state legislature says, we're gonna pull back authority to pick our slate of electors ourselves to fulfill the will of the people and deal with the fraud that we're seeing. And we're gonna certify this set of electors and they're gonna vote in the Capitol on December 14th. But let's suppose the other group of electors, either encouraged by the governor or doing it on their own, rent a hotel room in the Capitol and meet together and cast electoral college votes, and they send their electoral college votes to Congress to be counted. Um, then you get into this crazy world where Congress has to decide which slate of electors is the right slate of electors, and that opens up lots of machinations. Constitutionally, the authority to choose electors resides in state legislatures. Um, so it's supposed to be the state le legislature that chooses. In the 1800s, all of those state legislatures decided we want voters to choose electors, but there's no reason they, they could pull back that authority themselves um, with the caveat that there's some court considerations here, um, but the Supreme Court precedent seems to suggest that they could. 
Thank you. That's really helpful. And actually, we had had a question from our audience asking kind of just that is, can the, the state override, you know, the popular vote and, and select their um, electoral votes themselves and, and kind of determine that. So thank you for providing some clarity there. Um, I think on the topic, too, of just, you know, how this election might turn out, whether there's delays or fraud or other, you know, um, some margins for error that we haven't seen previously, I think maybe this is one of the more provocative questions of the night, but what happens in your view if President Trump doesn't accept the election results whenever those may be determined? And how does our political system respond to a president who may not uh, certify the valid validity of our election and not leave the office peacefully? Obviously, this is um, you know this is a a new sort of um, question we're asking, but I think it is top of mind for many. Yeah. So um, for those of you who are interested, there's a really interesting. Um, article in the Atlantic by Barton Gelman that kind of goes into this in some detail. And one of the interesting points that Gelman makes in this, in this article is um, elections tend not to end because all the votes are counted and someone has declared the winner. Usually they end because someone concedes. And um, the point that he makes in this article is that if the president refuses to concede and pursues every avenue, that could be really problematic um, from the perspective of a democratic system. So I'll give you a couple of scenarios here. So let's suppose that um, uh, Pennsylvania is pivotal for the outcome of the election, or we, maybe it's Florida or, or one of these other battleground states. And let's suppose they send two slates of electors to, to Congress. Well, the vice president is supposed to preside over the counting of the votes on January 6th. Um, what happens when the vice president is presented with two slates of electors that will determine the election outcome? Um, does the vice president get to choose which of those slates of electors is the right one? Or is the proper interpretation of the law that neither one of those slates of electors is counted? And then the House of Representatives chooses the president based on votes of state delegations. Um, if Nancy Pelosi anticipates that the vice president might declare um, the votes of a Republican slate of electors over her objections, could she pull um, all of her members out of the chamber so that the constitutional requirement that all of the votes be counted in the presence of the House and the Senate not be fulfilled in ways that throw it into confusion? Um, you know, these are possibilities. I, I will say, um, this is my, this is just my judgment, right? I don't think the court would allow it to get to that point. I think that um, judgments about the proper counting of the votes and the rules associated with it, given the stakes, I would be surprised if the court um, let it get to that point of a constitutional crisis. So my expectation would be that the court would do something similar, as consequential as it was for the court in 2000, um, do something similar in this case. I don't think they want to have a situation where two candidates show up on January 20th to be sworn in. I don't, <laughs> that seems, <laughs> that would make for good television, but I don't think it would make for good democracy. But. Absolutely. Well, I do want to um, get to the point of kind of the presidential transition, but we've had a few other questions come in from our audience. So maybe we'll pause for a minute and take those because they have to do with kind of polling and voting. So while we're still talking about that, and then we can move towards the transition. Um, so one question that came in is, what is the weight of undecided independent voters at the 11th hour of the race? So perhaps, you know, how, how important can independents and undecided voters come in in, in large numbers where maybe today we're unsure what that uh, turnout might be and, and how do you see that potentially impacting um, the results. And then kind of second question from someone else is, um, a lot of news outlets are highlighting the importance of suburban women voters. What is behind this 
demographic being seen as so pivotal. So I guess that's really two parts, independence, what role do they play? And then women, how does that um, play into, you know, voting for President Trump versus Biden in your view? Yeah, those are, those are good questions and um, ones that the campaigns are um, wrestling with right now. So let me, um, if I could just provide a little bit of context here in terms of what the campaigns are thinking, right? So they have narrowed down the, the contest to this set of primarily toss-up states that really are within that sort of less than 5% gap in these places. And they're probably even probably prioritizing among them in terms of where they wanna allocate time and attention. Within those states, they're not gonna go after all the voters. They're gonna go after um, two kinds of voters that are gonna be consequential for the outcome. Because in general, most of us are Republicans or Democrats. And when we're Republicans or Democrats, 90% of the time or higher, we vote for the Republican or the Democrat. And so we're not really gonna be sort of moved. Um, so what that means then is each campaign within a particular battleground state is gonna have in the bank a certain set of reliable party voters that are gonna show up no matter what and pull the lever for the R or the D. What's gonna matter for the election outcome is gonna be two groups. One are what we would call persuadables. These are people who are reliable voters, but their loyalty to one party is a little bit un uncertain. So they're gonna turn out, they're gonna vote because it's what they do, but they might be able to move back and forth from one party or the other. The other group are get out the vote targets. These are people who are reliably Republican or Democrat, but they don't vote all the time. Maybe um, you know they vote some of the time. And so what the campaigns are doing at the moment is trying to target these two groups, these persuadable voters and these get out the vote targets to animate and mobilize this group to make them realize it's worth their time to show up on election day or vote early or whatever. And for this group, persuade them that um, what that candidate cares about is what they care about. And the question about um, the kind of independent voters and the suburban women in some ways is, um, is sort of a similar question. Um, there are going into the election this year, as there were in 2016, a set of voters that still aren't entirely sure, that maybe think like, um, you know, I tend to vote Republican, but I'm not crazy about the president. Um, or, um, you know, I've always voted this way, but maybe my views are changing or, or something like that. And um, in this context, um, suburban women are one of the groups that they've identified as sort of falling into this category of people who are likely to vote, but are sort of movable one way or the other. And so there's a lot of then talk about how do you reach this group? Well, you reach them with the kinds of issues you talk about, the kinds of themes that you emphasize in the campaign, and then you um, amplify those things in particular events, whether it's a debate, whether it's a, a campaign visit, or whether it's advertising in some kind of broad form, either on social media or, or on television. And you want to talk about things that sort of make that group that could go one way or the other think, oh, okay, this is my home for this election at least. This is what I, I wanna do. Um, the one thing I'll say here, however, is that the number of truly, in my, in my sort of analysis, the number of truly undecided voters is smaller this go around than it was in 2016. Um, going into 2016, there were, there were a high number and it was largely because both candidates had high unfavorables. There weren't, it wasn't a lot of love for, for either one of those candidates. And so there were a lot of people going in that weren't delighted about either one. In this election season, the number of undecideds, I think, and right, we can talk about why I think this, um, looks like it's lower. And so there's less room for movement in that group. And that's partly why you see, um, I think particularly um, the president saying things in public forums that you think, who's that gonna persuade, right? Like who is he trying to persuade there? And the answer is in some of those things, he's not trying to persuade anybody. He's trying to mobilize a group that he needs to turn out in the election at a higher rate than they have in the past. And so he's trying to give them that additional motivation uh, to show up. One question I have in, in follow up to that is, you know, maybe there aren't as many undecided voters for the presidential race, but if we think about um, the congressional and Senate races, what do you think is 
at play there in terms of dynamics where potentially, for example, a Republican who traditionally would vote Republican might vote for President Biden, um, but still, you know, adhere to a Republican ticket down ballot? Uh, or do you think the likelihood that that voter would just vote straight Democrat? Um, I'm just curious where, whether there might be this kind of uh, imbalance that we perhaps haven't seen before in terms of presidential vote versus down ballot voting. Yeah, that's such an interesting uh, question, Margaret. I wanna highlight something that you said, right? Which is that um, the consequences of the national election down ballot are incredibly consequential. Um, so the high turnout rate here particularly if it turns out to be party line voting, can have consequences way down the ballot in um, state legislatures, governorships, lieutenant, you know, lieutenant governor, state attorneys general. And these state legislatures are gonna be doing redistricting. They're gonna be deciding what congressional districts are gonna look like, what state legislative districts are gonna look like. And so a lot of important policymaking happens at the, at the state level, including policymaking that affects what happens at the, at the national level. Um, your, your larger question, though, about how people are going to be voting here in terms of are they going to split their ticket? You know, are we likely to see cases where um, somebody might vote for a particular presidential candidate, but vote basically at their home for the rest of the, the rest of the ticket? Um, my, my general sense is I don't think it's going to happen a lot this election relative to others. And let me kind of explain why. Um, for, I would say, the last eight to 10 years, um, elections have been more nationalized. Politics has been more nationalized than at any time than I can remember. That um, even local races that have very little to do with national politics, like your state legislative race or something like that, is most reliably predicted by your views about the president, even though the president has nothing to do with that state legislative race. That's a completely separate thing. And whereas members of Congress used to have individual name recognition and de-emphasize their party connection, the parties have worked to nationalize it. So when I think about Jim Cooper here in Nashville, I'm not thinking about Jim Cooper as a person. I'm thinking about Jim Cooper as a Democrat. And so I do think there is, because of party polarization and the nationalization of politics, a sense in which there, there will be a larger number of people who are going to be voting straight party line. That's my, my general take, but I will add the caveat here that, and it goes back to your previous question, Margaret. Um, when we look at these, these polls that say, um, you know, who do you support? Do you support the vice president? Do you support the president? Um, sometimes the, the numbers that are called sort of undecided um, can be larger than the numbers I would say. So I would say the number of undecideds is probably somewhere between two and eight um, in most of these polls, whereas, in the previous election, it was probably over 10. Um, you may see some numbers over 10, but part of the reason for that is there are cases where um, you'll get Republicans or Democrats who say, um, I'm not voting for either one of those people. Like, I'm gonna vote, but you know, like Mitt Romney said, I, I voted, but I didn't vote for President Trump. He didn't say he voted for Vice President Biden and Larry Hogan, the governor of Maryland, said the same thing, right? So I do think there is some of what you're suggesting, right? Which is like, um, it's not traditional split ticketing, right? It's I'm voting for a third party or, or something like that. Um, the other thing I would say is I, I think that, um, yeah, like given the polarization, there is sort of a, you know, my vote is sending a message up and down the ticket kind of feel this election season. Great, thank you. Um, and then I guess kind of final question from the audience on in terms of turnout and voting. Um, we've seen in the news in recent days that early voting turnout has been substantial this year. Do you think um, that this pace of, of turnout will be higher than in the past? And do you think that will continue going forward in future elections? I think it's a it's a really interesting question. I guess I'll say I've given more thought to the first part of that question than to the second part of that question. 
So let me answer the first part first. Um, so what do we think about turnout in this election? I think that anecdotally, most of us probably are having the same experience in this election season. That is, our impression is that people that we know are more motivated to vote than in previous elections. Um, people that we talk to are more engaged in politics and more likely to vote. The early voting numbers and the projections that I've seen suggest that that's true, that this is going to be an extremely high turnout election relative to others. Um, the latest projection I saw suggested about 150 million votes relative to 137 million in the previous, the previous election, and maybe a voting eligible population rate of 65% or something in that range with, you know, with some margin of error there. And high turnout makes a big difference in terms of election outcomes. Um, in the long run, um, I, I guess my 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 expectation is that um, it will th that this is an unusually high election given the polarizing nature of the president who's in office, um, and my expectation is that turnout rates will probably go go back down some, with the caveat that. I always have to add, right, which is political polarization and the kind of nastiness of politics that makes people hate each other and fear outcomes and the sort of hate fear monger kind of campaigning does mobilize people. It does, if you feel like the country is gonna end if you don't vote, or you feel like the country is gonna become socialist if you don't vote, um, or you feel, all right, I was gonna delve into conspiracy theories, but I won't do that. But if you feel like there are those kinds of issues at stake, you're more likely to vote. And um, we know from our research on voter turnout that when we think the stakes are very high, that is, there's a big difference between the parties, and we think that the election can be close so that our vote can matter, then turnout, turnout goes, way, goes way up. And so the question is, does the next election have the same kind of stakes? Do people really sort of feel like the whole future of the country is at stake um, uh, it doesn't always feel that way, at least in my, in my experience. We will see. We will see. Um, great. And I guess last, there's one more question. The turnout and the, the voter behavior is, is very good. Um, so analysts felt that one reason Donald Trump fared better in the polls in 2016 was that some Trump partisans didn't tell pollsters that they favored Trump for fear of being shamed. Is this likely to be a factor this time around? Was a question from the audience. Yeah. Is there this dynamic at play? And it's kind of what I was speaking to earlier about party lines and voting that way or not. Um, but who, how much of the population is not voicing their view publicly? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So it can kind of work itself into polling outcomes in two ways. One is that um, uh, you may not respond to the poll at all, right? That is, you may not answer the phone, or if you leave the polling place and it's an exit poll, you may not talk to the, to the, to the poll worker in ways that lead the sample of people surveyed to be different systematically from the population as a whole. The other way it can work its way in is if you'd agreed to take the poll, but you don't tell them the truth about sort of your, your views. Um, uh, in the office next to me is uh, Josh Clinton. And Josh led the American Association of Public Opinion Research's postmortem on the 2016 election. So the Professional Association of Pollsters, Josh chaired their, their evaluation of what happened. And my recollection from talking to him was that this idea that there are a bunch of shy Trump voters, um, there wasn't a ton of evidence for it in 2016. Um, now, one thing that gives me a little bit of pause, however, was this point that I made earlier, which is that um, the polls in 2018 in the midterm elections, again, seem to underestimate Republican votes and Democratic votes in the same states that they did in 2016. Not completely, like they were more accurate and the bigger the state and the more polling, the more accurate it was. But there still was this sense that um, uh, in some of these, say, Rust Belt states, the polling was underestimating Republican support in a systematic way, which makes me wonder what's what's going on there. Like, what what's still 
sort of sticky. Um, the other reason I'm, a, but I'm, I'm a little bit dubious about the the shy Trump voter thing is um, it really has become part of an identity for many people, right? Like your political views are um, kind of an essential part of your, you know, identity now more than I think in earlier periods in ways that I think, you know, lots of people are happy to express, you know, more yard signs, more trucks painted a particular way, more political messages on Facebook, those kinds of things. Um, but that's just anecdotal. That's just my, my impression. But Josh would say, I think, that while there's a little bit of evidence, it's not, it's not overwhelming. Great. Thank you. So we have a little under 20 minutes left. So thank you for everyone who's asked questions so far. I encourage you to keep submitting and we'll revert back at the end. But I did want to cover a topic that Professor Lewis uh, has quite some expertise on, which is presidential transitions. So um, can you provide us with some historical context for presidential transitions in the past and which ones have been successful, which ones may have been characterized as more disruptive. And as we think about this, you know, how effective was the Obama to Trump transition in 2016 and, and the President Bush to President Obama transition before that, if you could speak to those, those instances. Yeah, um, I'm happy to do that. I think that's a, it's an important and underappreciated aspect of organizing a campaign for the presidency. So most presidential campaigns, this was true of both Secretary Clinton and uh, President Trump in 2016, um, all presidential candidates, if they're not in office already, begin in the spring preparing to take over the government. And it's a massive job. So you're going to be managing an organization with 2.8 million civilian employees, a budget of $4.4 trillion, and the things that government does are given to government because they're so important, right? Things like, um, you know, providing food stamps or a clean environment or national security or um, landing planes on time or delivering mail. Like the government does lots of things that are consequential. And presidents immediately on January 20th are going to be responsible, along with Congress and the courts, but uh, obviously the president more so, um, those kinds of things. And um, to take on that kind of management job, you can't do it in just the period between election day and inauguration day. And so they're planning in advance. Now, I will say in this election season, because the president is an incumbent, he doesn't have a formal transition, obviously, the vice, but the vice president does. And I know that he's begun planning. He's got a close associate, Ted Kaufman, who's running his transition. And they're doing a number of things to, to prepare. The president though is in some ways preparing for a second term in a way that looks kind of like a transition. That is they're um, figuring out um, what administrative policies they wanna change, what do they wanna do with personnel, what's their budget strategy moving forward given the context of the pandemic and the growing national debt, what's their agenda for foreign policy, what's their legislative agenda. So they're doing something similar but on a much smaller scale and with people in government already. Um, Okay, so historical context here. Um, as a general matter, um, this is a hard thing, right? Like it is, um, you know, these elections are bitter. They're often personal. Um, and what you're requiring people to do is to um, be their better selves in the face of somebody that has slandered them, right? Over the course of a long period of time and sometimes very personal um, and, you know, not very nice ways. And so there have been, you know, periods in American history where, you know, presidents, one president departing didn't even stay for the inauguration of their successor, or one president refused to sit in the carriage with another and so didn't go to the inauguration at all. Um, or, you know, those kinds of those kinds of things, or refused invitations to the White House in advance, or refused to meet before the inauguration took place. That changed a bit with the Cold War. Um, so because of the consequences uh, for continuity of government and for international relations, there became more, uh, I think, pressure on both parties to at least give the appearance of the important of sort of continuity of, of government. And um, over time, um, 
the information shared in taking over government was sort of passed along by previous um, administrations of your own party or people in and around government. In the modern period, though, um, the, the previous administrations have been smart. They enacted some common sense policies to facilitate the transmission of information from the sitting administration to the new one um, and uh, make it easier for them to cooperate. And for the most part, they've done a pretty good job at that. We're much better at transitions than we were even you know, 20 years ago when I started paying attention to these things. Um, we've had some really excellent transitions and I would say um, the, the transition from Clinton to George W. Bush was very good. The transition from George W. Bush to Barack Obama was excellent. The transition from Barack Obama to Donald Trump less good. Um, uh, there's a, um, if you want a, a more detailed accounting of that particular transition um, and or sort of your own explanation, I'm, I'm happy to give you my explanation for what happened there. Um, Michael Lewis's book, The Fifth Risk, does a really excellent, beautifully written job of explaining kind of what's at stake in transitions and how this, this one, um, what happened in it. What do you think happened in 30 seconds or less? I mean, and, and how do you think that might uh, play out here if we're thinking about a Trump to Biden transition? So um, in 2016, Governor Christie was in charge of the president's transition team and done an, an immense amount of work preparing for a Trump presidency. Um, despite in some ways disinterest from the president. The president was upset that Christie was spending money that he thought was his money to run the campaign. Um, personal conflicts between Chris Christie and Jared Kushner um, led to after the election when the president won, Jared Kushner taking all of the work that Chris Christie had done and putting it in the trash. <coughs> Excuse me. And basically starting from scratch after the election day. So he and the vice president then took over the responsibility of trying to plan a transition in that sort of short period. What that led to was a series of problems. No landing teams to go to agencies to figure out what needed to be done, an understaffed and overwhelmed and inexperienced personnel team, um, and a budget that the president put together that was ignored by Congress because it wasn't really a budget at all. Um, and so the, it led to the president getting off to a terrible start right at the beginning, doing things like the Muslim ban that was such a poorly crafted, poorly vetted, poorly implemented public policy, a budget, you know, so it was, it was really problematic. And I think another aspect of the <coughs> Trump administration has just been kind of the lack of fulfilling their appointments. So can you talk a bit about the appointments process and um, you know, you, you just mentioned public policy kind of as a theme that we haven't discussed yet. So what are the implications and how purposeful is the Trump administration in keeping some of our uh, overseas appointments in particular vacant? And how do you think that plays a role in public policy, not just for President Trump, but for any president that we might see and, and what levers are there for the president and his administration to pull in order to influence public policy uh, by nature of who's representing our country overseas. Yeah, so um, you're absolutely right. The constitution provides that presidents nominate with the advice and consent of the Senate, all principal officers of government. So think all of the executive branch officials, but also all ambassadors and consuls. So the ambassador corps uh, is selected by the president and confirmed by the Senate. The president also selects U.S. attorneys and U.S. marshals throughout the throughout the country. Um, the president uh, has had a difficult time filling these jobs during his administration and has worked with large numbers of acting officials or successions of acting officials during his presidency. Um, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is the president did get off to a slow start in terms of naming officials. He was actually very quick with regard to some of his initial White House appointments and then the cabinet. Beyond that, things got a little tricky and some of those nominees ended up not being vetted particularly well. Um, but the president was slow. So in the first year of the Trump presidency, of all of the Senate confirmed positions, of which there are over 1,300, the president had named people, nominated, not had them confirmed, nominated only 39% people to only 39% of those jobs. Um, and that includes a large number of ambassadors. 
um, the president's um, response there was, well, um, the Senate has been obstructionist, uh, and particularly Senate Democrats have been obstructionist. And then he said, I don't want to fill all these jobs. Um, and he's right. Um, it, I, he could be right about both of those things. So the Senate Democrats were obstructionists. They did slow things down as much as they could because I think they felt uh, upset at the um, uh, one, the nominees who were brought through, and, and two, the kind of change in rules associated with certain kinds of appointments. Um, and the president does like acting officials. The difficulty with acting officials is that there are statutory limits on how long they can be in a job. So 210 days um, with a few caveats. And that means that there's just new people cycling in uh, and out of these jobs. And then at some point, the position stays vacant. And then the legal authority for that job is delegated down to an even lower level official um, who um, is a career professional that you know, um, probably shouldn't have that kind of legal authority. Um, the critics of the president say this is really problematic for management. And in many cases, what the president has done, they suggest has been illegal in terms of the uh, vacancies and the way the president has filled those jobs. The president, however, maintains that these vacancies are not problematic and they give the president more control uh, over the executive. Thank you. And actually, that's a great segue into a question we got from our audience, which is, um, if Vice President Biden wins, to what extent can he uh, kind of use his own executive orders to undo certain policies that the Trump administration has put into place? And I might just add to that, you know, as context, we've obviously seen President Trump utilize the executive order um, many times throughout the course of his administration. So, and that can be controversial in some groups, depending on uh, your views. But do you think that uh, Biden will do something similar or will he step back from that and focus more on uh, kind of having the three branches work together um, maybe as, you know, uh, as an alternative? Yeah, I think that the, the question highlights something really distinctive about the modern presidency more than earlier presidencies. And, um, and that's the extent to which presidents are using existing legal authority and constitutional authority to set public policies through executive order um, or through other forms of unilateral action. And President Trump is, um, is no different in this regard. Um, so the question is how durable are these these actions. Um, so with regard to executive orders, not very. Um, so if the president issues an executive order, a president Biden could come in and, and turn that order over with another executive order. That's a pretty straightforward thing to do. The president just this week issued an executive order to create a whole new class of political appointees, um, which has caused some consternation among good government types, but it's the kind of order that would be easy enough for a new president to, to, to overturn. Um, there's two other aspects of this. One is basically, um, you know, will uh, President Biden be a different kind of president that is less unilateral, less imperialistic, um, I think is the, is the question. And then what else could Biden do to undo some of the things that Trump has done? So in the first regard, um, Presidents tend to take unilateral actions in part because they can't get legislation. Um, so they'll try to find this existing legal authority to circumvent Congress. So a lot of what, what they would prefer to do things through legislation precisely because it's more durable. And so I think that the vice president, given his history and given the likely composition of Congress moving forward, will probably be more successful in acting legislation than this president has been. Um, but I don't expect him to unilaterally disarm with regard to executive power. Um, he may not need to use it as much because he may be more successful in Congress given a change in the composition of Congress, but um, all modern presidents are doing this more and more. Um, now, in terms of reversing policies that the president has put in place, um, in addition to presidents doing things through executive action, agencies are doing the same thing, right? They're um, stopping ongoing rulemaking processes or trying to roll back existing regulations in ways that are consequential. Those kinds of things, um, if they have been done through the proper legal channels, um, take time to roll back and there are restrictions on how much you can do that way. And so that could take 
two to three years, maybe the entire first term of the Biden administration. The president has made it his mission during his presidency to roll back many of the things that the Obama administration put in place during their, during their tenure. So I don't see the vice president being Whiggish in the sense of like rolling back presidential power per se, but I do think he'll be more cooperative with Congress um, just by his nature and by the composition of Congress would be my guess. Thank you. And I guess last question from me in terms of uh, some of the appointments and how Biden might approach that. He has said, um, I believe that he would consider even appointing some Republicans to certain positions. In your view, how do you think um, the more, I guess, uh, far left Democrats are viewing that it, given they've supported his, him as a more moderate candidate? Um, do you think there will be pushback from uh, Congress and you know some of his representatives in the Democratic Party if he goes that direction? Or do you think that uh, he would be able to succeed in kind of bridging this gap to create a more inclusive government? Or will he hit some roadblocks with some pressure from um, you know those, those senators and congressmen before doing so? Yeah. <clears throat> So um, that's a, it's an interesting question. I think you're right that the stories that I've been seeing this week in particular have been about uh, certain Republicans being vetted for cabinet jobs in a Biden administration. I think I saw John Kasich was one of these folks. Um, it's not uncommon for presidents to identify um, people from the other party to serve it in at least one position in their cabinet as kind of a symbolic move to um, signify national unity and um, a kind of um, sort of bipartisan spirit and so forth. And so I suspect that that's a, a reasonable chance. But um, Margaret, I think you're right that there is um, um, there's going to be a battle over the Biden administration appointments. And it's um, I would analogize it to the um, to the fight over Reagan administration appointments. Um, so um, one of the things that I did in one of my previous projects, uh, a, book, a book project was I interviewed a bunch of personnel directors for various presidents going back. And I interviewed Penn James, who was the uh, President Reagan's director of presidential personnel. And um, he described in, in great detail um, fights within the administration about um, what a Reagan administration would look like. And in particular, there was a real concern among what he called movement conservatives that the Reagan revolution in government wouldn't happen if kind of rank and file, run of the mill establishment Republicans um, dominated the jobs in the Reagan administration. And so there was a, um, a big internal fight about who was gonna staff the, the Reagan administration. And, and here um, there are, um, a number of uh, Democrats uh, further on the left who feel like they have held their tongue and um, supported the vice president in this campaign, and they have a strong interest in uh, public policy being pushed further to the left. And they will complain, sometimes vocally, um, if the vice president doesn't make some progressive appointments in positions that are really important to them. Um, I don't think that it would lead to a nominee being derailed, um, but it would manifest itself in other in other ways. Thank you so much. I think we're at time um, for the evening, but I so appreciate your willingness to speak with this group, and we will look forward to following up in a few weeks to hear your views about where we are in the world then, which normally would be a pretty straightforward prediction, but I fear that uh, we, we may not have the, the status quo, so to speak. So um, thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. Um, again, I believe Catherine posted a survey in the chat box if you're able to take that quickly before you leave. And uh, Professor Lewis, uh, great, great job this evening on sharing your insights. And we so appreciate it and look forward to seeing you soon. Great. Thank you, Margaret. It's a delight to see you and um, all uh, the other alums. Um, thanks for 
Thanks for joining. Okay, good night, everyone.